Let's explore some common application vulnerabilities. One thing we see here is one of the most common, and that is a man in the middle or meat in the middle, where we have a attacker who's actually sniffing a legitimate session, okay, passively, or they're actively injecting themselves into a particular session. So session management is extremely important. In this situation, it'll be the process of protecting against session hijacking, specifically against pseudo-random session identifiers. So we see in this diagram that the attacker has to discover the session ID of the authenticated user to pull off an exploit. So she can collect samples of session IDs and try to guess a valid ID for another user session. She could also steal using cross-site scripting or by getting physical access to web cookies stored on an endpoint. Other popular methods with web servers involve distributing fake or spoofed CA certificates. Some countermeasures that we could do here would include encoding heuristic metadata like IP addresses into a session ID, or using the session secure module property to modify each session ID by appending a hash or a MAC generated from various metadata. We could also use HSTS, HTTP Strict Transport Security, which is a recent standard that allows web applications to request that browsers only use encrypted access for them. HSTS is enabled on servers with the strict-transport-security code. Some other common vulnerabilities include cookie storage and transmission. Cookies typically don't hold confidential information, but attackers can still use them to develop a well-crafted attack. For example, they could extract a user's regular visit to a banking or brokerage site and then support a spear phishing or a farming attack. Cookies should be securely stored using encryption. Sensitive cookies should be stored securely on the web server with pointers on the clients. Buffer overflows take advantage of poorly written applications or operating system code. As a matter of fact, they're one of the most common patches and updates that you receive on operating systems and servers. Injection of malicious code can be accomplished with a denial of service to memory buffers and addresses or even a SQL injection method. They cause errors or they can run command shells and programs to further launch an exploit to deliver malware. One example is a packet holding a long string of NOP, no operation instructions, followed by a command. It's called a NOP slide, and it forces the processor to locate where a command can actually be executed. This can be mitigated with proper input validation and regular vendor patches and updates. As a matter of fact, the primary countermeasures to these types of attacks is input validation and patching. We also have memory leaks. We can do a short-lived user land application, a long-lived user land application, and the kernel land process. A memory leak is an unintentional memory consumption where the programmer fails to free an allocated block of memory when it's no longer needed. With short-lived user land application, little if any noticeable effect will be there. Modern operating systems recollect lost memory after a program terminates. With long-lived user land application, you have a potentially dangerous situation. These applications continue to waste memory over time, eventually consuming all RAM resources. This leads to abnormal system behavior. With the kernel land process, which is also dangerous, memory leaks in the kernel level lead to serious system stability issues. Kernel memory is very limited compared to user land memory and should be handled cautiously. Race conditions happen when a piece of code doesn't function as designed. They're the result of unexpected ordering of events, which can lead to the finite state machine of the code transitioning to an undefined state. It can also cause contention of more than one thread of execution over the same resource. Multiple threads of execution acting or manipulating the same area in memory or persistent data, which gives rise to integrity issues. How do we fix this? Well, programmers need to test for race conditions, or you could use something like OWASP Zap against web servers to test for race conditions on web services. 
There's also TOC, TOU, time of check, time of use. In an OWASP environment against a web server, time of check, time of use race conditions happen when between the time in which a given resource is checked and the time that the resource is used, a change happens in the resource to invalidate the results of the check. Some consequences are access controls, where the attacker can get access to otherwise unauthorized resources, or authorization, where race conditions such as this kind can be employed to get read or write access to resources which are not typically readable or writable by the user. There's also integrity issues, where the resource in question or other resources may be changed in an undesirable fashion by a malicious user. Accountability, if a file or other resource is written in this way, as opposed to in a valid way, logging of the activity may never occur. And then non-repudiation. In some situations, it may be possible to delete files a malicious user might not otherwise have access to, such as log files. Other common vulnerabilities are resource exhaustion. The most common result of this is a denial of service. The software may slow down, crash due to unhandled errors, or lock out legitimate users. In some situations, it may be possible to force the software to fail open in the event of a resource exhaustion. The state of the application and possibly the security functionality can then be compromised. The aforementioned memory leak is a type of resource exhaustion. Some countermeasures of RE is to harden the devices with network foundation protections, protecting the control plane, management plane, and data plane. Also, make sure systems are patched. Yes, I said it again. And also perform regular vulnerability scans. Data remnants are the residual representation of digital data that remain even after an attempt has been made to remove or erase the data. This residue may result from data being left intact by a nominal file deletion operation or by reformatting a storage media that doesn't remove the data completely or through physical properties of the storage media that allow previously written data to be recovered. What's the fix for this? Make sure we use military grade data wiping software and hardware. Code reuse attacks or software exploits where an attacker directs control flow through existing code with a malicious result. And third-party software libraries represent one of the most overlooked threats to enterprise security. That's because open source components are regularly used by enterprise application developers to speed the development process and avoid reinventing the wheel. Third-party code makes up between 30% and 90% of typical applications, according to industry estimates. While using third-party or open-source libraries is a great time saver, it also exposes organizations to many thousands of lines of software that was not authorized internally and can contain vulnerabilities. Perhaps the most egregious recent example of a vulnerability in a third-party library was the notorious Heartbleed bug incident in early 2014 on open SSL servers. What's the fix? Having policies, procedures, and technologies implemented early in the design life cycle. Also, audit any open source software in use, especially in high priority apps. You also want to restrict the download of non approved software. And finally, some firms like to apply hosted or on premise static analysis. SAST of source code.